Man, it's good to have you on the pod, B. Yeah, man. Um, appreciate you having me. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, we're joined today by Brandon Pajemski, somebody who I consider to be a beast when it comes to attacking the mission. Uh, Santa Clara alum, uh, Santa Clara WCC Co-Player of the Year. Uh, furthermore, went on to be drafted 19th overall by the Golden State Warriors. How you doing, man? I'm good. Um, NBA life is definitely different than college. Yeah. Um, but it's for better, for sure. All right, enough. All right, enough. Now, I kind of want to start at the beginning stages of your life. So when you were a little kid, uh, we all have our story of like when we were first introduced to basketball. Uh, so I'm sure you have yours. What is like the first memory, the first story that sticks out of when a basketball was first put in your hands or when you first fell in love with the game? Yeah, I think uh, growing up, I was a baseball kid for sure. You know, that's all I really played. My dad wouldn't let me play anything else. And uh, every Saturday, there's, you know, games on CBS and stuff. So I would just watch it um, through my time playing baseball. And eighth grade kind of hit, and I was like, Dad, I think this is too boring for me. I'm going to try something more up tempo. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, you could try basketball. So I tried basketball, and you know, ever since eighth grade, I kind of just took off with it. Yeah. Um, I was a little bit taller back then. Um, for my age, and so I was a center. I kind of screwed up um, until guard now. So I think eighth grade was when I uh, started first started playing, but I was introduced to it, you know, sixth, seventh grade, just watching on TV, just telling my dad it looked fun. Mm. Now, did your dad want you to play baseball because that's what he played when he was younger? Yeah, he uh, he played baseball when, when he was, uh, you know, growing up and stuff. Like, you know, he had a chance to play college, but he had me instead. Mm -hmm. um, and so ever since I was born, everything was everything baseball in my room was surrounded by baseball stuff. So it's kind of all I knew. And um, my mom's the type of type of mom that's just laid back, kind of just goes with the flow. And yeah. That's whatever you like, you can do. Mm -hmm. And my dad was like, "No, you have to play baseball. You have to play baseball." Um, and I did it for the longest time until uh, I just found a passion and love for basketball. I love it. I love it. Now you ended up going to high school at St. John's Northwestern Military Academy. Uh, in Delafield, Wisconsin, which is 25 minutes from where you were born in Greenfield. Uh, what was that experience like? Because I know most people are scared of the military, so it kind of gets people on edge. But the fact that you, you know, accepted it and went through all of that, can you talk to us about the experience and how it kind of shaped the way you are today? Yeah, I think it was a life-changing experience for me. Um, you know, just um, growing up there definitely was structure, but um, in terms of, like, what I prioritized in my life, I think leading up to that wasn't, the right things mm -hmm. and i think uh, when i went there for those for those high school years i think kind of taught me discipline you know how to treat people and uh, you know how to be a leader both you know on the basketball court and just with people in general um and so those three years um you learned a lot and i remember growing up my parents you know when i'm getting in trouble at school they were like oh we're gonna send you to st john's like it was a bad thing and then yeah. in hindsight you look back at it and it was like it really was a blessing in, this, in disguise so mm -hmm. Of what it taught me of you know how to be clean yeah. how to be proper how to use your man or stuff like that mm -hmm. i love it and i think one thing that i remember your dad speaking on was that at that school one thing they preach is like you complete the mission no matter what uh and i bring that up to say because before you went to santa clara you actually started off at university of illinois uh and i know that experience was a little different in itself uh because we were there before transferring to santa clara but from what I've heard is that no matter how tough the experience, you still completed the mission, still attacked the mission every single day. You still had a 3.8 GPA. You still went to practice. You still said, hey, I'm going to work hard, even though I may not be playing as much as I want to. How are you able to keep that mindset? Are you thankful for yourself to keep that discipline before you went on to Santa Clara? Yeah, I think the mindset was always made to the NBA. And, you know, I would never let another man, aka the head coach, you know, not let me pursue that dream. And mm -hmm. um, even though I wasn't being able to play on the actual floor, um, I knew I could get better and then uh, my future could be better somewhere else. And that's where Santa Clara came into play. But yeah, I think it's just about, you know, sometimes you got to look at yourself in the mirror and it's bigger than yourself. And we ended up winning the Big Ten Championship that year. And, uh, you know, I just tried to make the, the starters and the main guys as best they could mm -hmm. to help us square. And so I thought it was just a team effort and completed the mission. Sure. And obviously, uh, you ended up being successful, but can you talk about the experience? Because I think when some parents or kids may look at the situation, they'll be like, oh, he didn't really get to play while he was there and he had to leave schools. Can you talk about how 
sometimes certain situations don't fit the player per se. Mm-hmm. And if the player is in the right right uh, situation, then things can work out like you and Santa Clara. Yeah, I think, um, you know, coming out of high school, it was during COVID. Mm-hmm. And so the schools I had, I didn't get to take any visits to them. So it was kind of just based off Zoom, phone calls, wow. um, you know, seeing pictures and stuff. And, you know, I ultimately chose Illinois just because it was, it was four hours from home. Yeah. And uh, I felt comfortable there. Um, if I didn't like it, I could go home on the weekend to see my family. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it did work out. Um, but at the same time, like I tell all the NBA teams that I talked to during the process was kind of was a blessing because like, I know playing for the Warriors now, like I'm not going to get all the shots, all the minutes right away. Mm-hmm. And just being able to handle that piece of adversity, um, you know, a lot of guys in my position haven't had to go through that yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's really helping for this level. Yeah. Um, where back then people were like, oh, he's probably not that good. He can't play. And then, you know, um, you know, they say the grass isn't always greener and, uh, you know, I would tell people just go where you're needed, not where you know you're wanted or the attention is. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where Santa Clara came into play. For sure. Yeah, I think your story is truly unique just because of the fact that coming out of high school, you were Mr. Basketball uh, for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, you were all state. So for you to go to Illinois and then people see you not really play that much, they're kind of like, what's going on? But behind the scenes, all basketball players know like certain situations just don't work out. It doesn't have to do with anything that you're doing or anything with the players, it's just all about being in the right opportunity. Um, so I think when you when you maneuver that, now you go to Santa Clara, what, do you, what is your thoughts when you get to Santa Clara University? Cause- yeah, honestly, me my family, um, you know, it was a hard thought process of which club I'm gonna go to, just cause, you know, one time transfer rule was just like, you get one, t- one time transferred and you gotta sit out. Um, well, you, you were still there when it was just only one transfer rule. Like, you couldn't leave any time you wanted. No, I could leave and go to t- Santa Clara and play right away. Oh, go ahead. But I knew if I made a bad decision then, then I would have to transfer again and then be like, I just sit out. out. Gotcha. And so it was like a long process of like, look, what are the benefits, what are the negatives? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, big shout out to Jalen. I mean, he's probably the biggest reason I went there, just seeing with his success and what he did. Um, you know, I had copies of my ability already, but just seeing where, where he ended up um, at Santa Clara. Um, you know, gave me the confidence that, oh, I can go in there and do the same thing. But for me, it was a two-year plan going in, mm-hmm. um, you know, spend my sophomore junior there and see what was available. And I think halfway through the year, um, yes, Pepperdine, uh, early at college play is when I kind of just like, the switch kind of flipped for me. And when I started seeing my name on some board and stuff, and throughout the year, I kept getting higher, higher. And then, you know, same with the pre-job process, just kind of attacked it as I could and got it to 19. I love it. I love it. And we recently had Jalen on the show, so it's nice to have have you here and, and talk about your experience. Um, now, while you were at Santa Clara, I know that part of the blueprint in choosing Santa Clara or choosing whatever school it was you were going to go to after you arrived was that one, it had to have, it had to require somebody who just went to the NBA from that school. And another part of that blueprint is it's not about the name on the jersey, but it's more so about Will you get playing time? Is is that correct? Hundred percent. That's why. That's why I say. I mean, you know, go where you're needed, not even what you wanted. Um, mm-hmm. And I felt that uh, you know, Coach Sinek and his staff needed a place for for Jalen, mm-hmm. uh, for PJ, um, and I thought that I, I fit that. And I credit um, you know, Coach and his staff for finding me. Honestly, yeah. I mean, you know, the twelfth pick in the draft, and then they're bringing in someone who you know I had seventeen TNPs a freshman year. So, um, you know, I credit them and for giving me the confidence to just come in there and just be me. And then you talked about Coach Sendek and, and the opposite of the assistants. Is there anything that they did to prove that Santa Clara was the right pick? Like, is there anything special that they did while they were there? Or anything you could take away from them that like, hey, I'm glad I'm in good hands. They, these are good people and they truly want me to succeed. Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing um, was the relationship Coach made with, with my family. Mm-hmm. I think it was just more than just me yeah. that he cared about. And same with the assistants. Uh, you know, the relationship with the family was something that was crucial for me because I think I didn't have that, you know, full body experience um, at Illinois. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that I wanted that, you know, my parents could call and talk to them whenever and it didn't even have to be about me or basketball. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think that was super important, but also um, just seeing the style of play and how we played it, how it translated to the NBA level um, where Illinois was coming up kind of different big 10 basketball is a little bit different than yeah. wcc basketball and uh just seeing those two things and combination with Jalen and what he did um it just kind of made sense yeah 
Now, was coming from the Midwest to the West Coast, was that like a huge change for you or you're good with change? I know when I first left Chicago to come to Santa Clara, I had like homesickness for like maybe like the first couple of weeks of summer school. Then after that, everything was all good. Is it cool with you? Yeah, it's been cool for me. Um, you know, obviously going to military schools, high school, I, I, you could do whatever. I've been away from my family and, and slept without them per se. Um, you know, what is this for? Seven years now. So, uh, you know, I'm cool with living on my own, you know, being away from my family. Uh, but it's all for the right reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will say I haven't been to California for a family player. So I've gone on a visit there. I never seen what California was like, especially out of California. Um, but it, it's it's definitely different. But, you know, I wouldn't change it. You wouldn't change it. Yeah. I like it. Now, your take versus... High major and mid major, because I know this gets talked about a lot, uh, especially with the landscape of college basketball changing every single year. And I know now people are coming from high major to mid major. People may look at your story and be like, oh, I can do the same thing. I don't have to go to this big school just because of the name on the jersey and whatnot. So, what would you say to the younger generation when they get ready to choose whatever school it is they want to attend? Is there anything you could attest to high major versus mid major? Yeah, I, I honestly don't think nowadays with the transfer portal and I, I don't really think. There's much of a difference in high major and mid major talent. We are on, you know, you see guys all the time that that make it from from both places. Um, you know, you look at Paolo, who won rookie of the year, who moved from high major. Jalen came to second at mid major. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's give or take either way. And I think it goes back to being where you needed. Yeah. And just being able to perform on on a stage where where you're able to be seen for sure. And I think along with that, I think it's like your determination and your work ethic. Mm -hmm which I know you have. And I think uh, Coach Jason Lovick told me this one story. He said that usually he does things for like red shirts and freshmen where he'll get an extra work with them on the side. And he said he would still show up to those workouts and try to get into those workouts and even say, hey, Brandon, man, you're working too hard, man. We need you for the game. You can't be coming to all these extra workouts. Uh, is, is that how you would say you model your game and what you want people to know about you? Yeah, I think 100%. It goes back to me as a, as a teammate, as a leader. Like I don't want to feel I'm bigger or better than anybody, I think, you know, whatever work they're putting in, I can use the same thing because, you know, you're never good enough. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so, yeah, I think a lot of times last year that was the case, um, but it was just ultimately just me trying to get better. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Now, you've had a chance to be in many different places, uh, high school, University of Illinois, Santa Clara, now you're going to be with the uh, Golden State Warriors. I need to know about nicknames because I've heard that you've had a lot of nicknames over the years. Can you give us some that you can recall or that stand out to you? Yeah, Pods for sure. Uh, first for a letter, my last name, uh, BP. Uh, out with the words, BP2. Mm. Um, white chocolate, they called me back a lot growing up. Uh, really had assassin. Yep. Uh, air pods, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you also have like air pods. Do people call you air pods? Mm -hmm. I heard there was something where like somebody had like air pods and then you can open up the okay, case. Yeah, you know, it's your fix. And then, where was that at? Uh, that was in Illinois. I remember um, playing my first game, and uh, I caught a dunk mm -hmm. on the transition. And um, ever since then, they kind of just called me that because they had the that. I love it. I love it. And your grandfather, what has he met in your life? I know you really focus on him and love to communicate with him from time to time. And how has he influenced your life? Yeah, I think uh, he's influenced in a big way just because, you know, through my dad teaching me baseball, the growing up in basketball, he's always, you know, he's always had a smile on his face, no matter if it's good, bad, or different for us in the family. Um, so, you know, just seeing that from, you know, my dad getting bad at me, uh, from not playing well, for my mom kind of just being mom and just being there, she would understand it. Mm -hmm. Just having another male figure, um, you know, like my grandpa, that is always just a smile on his face, and he tells me how it is from a whole another perspective versus a, a dad who played the sport try to teach the son, mm -hmm. um, you know, his perspective about things I, I listen to because it's a very generic and what he sees and just, he doesn't know the game that's way to help baseball at all either. Um, so just hearing his perspective on things is, it's pretty special. Nice. And obviously along with your grandfather, your sister, uh, Gabriella West, I know she cried on the night that you got drafted. Uh, and obviously she doesn't play basketball or anything like that, but how did that feel knowing that your sister like really felt that moment and obviously she showed her really emotions that she truly cares for Yeah, I knew she had it and it had it in her. Yeah. Um, you know, she likes to act like she doesn't like me or doesn't like to know what's going on, but 
Um, at the end of the day, she's my sister. Yeah. You know, I love her to death. And, um, you know, it was cool to see. I mean, it was cool to see just the, the whole family, everyone that was there, just kind of celebrate that moment. Mm -hmm. And now during that moment uh, at the NBA draft, what was probably the number one experience that you could remember from that night? Because I know it's a long night. I remember you mentioning last night that you're on the bus for like two and a half hours uh, getting over to Brooklyn. And most people don't realize that. But throughout that whole night, was there one moment that stuck out other than obviously getting your, hearing your name get called? Honestly, um, from that night, I didn't really remember much. Mm. Honestly, it was just kind of like your name got called and you just were up there. I didn't remember you know, where I walked to, you know, anything like that. It was just, um, just all kind of a blur and, and excitement. Um, mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say anything stood out besides me and your name called us. All I remember is just hearing my name and then everything else after that was just like. And everything goes pretty quick after that, right? Because after that night, you pretty much go straight. Yeah, I got, I got drafted. I think it was probably around 10, 30, 11 o'clock mm -hmm. Eastern time. But wow. um, did media for like an hour or two. So I was done mm -hmm. at one. Then uh, we went out, um, our agency had a little spot, so we went out and my flight was at 4.30. And you were out of it. Sure. That's a lot. And then you had time to go back home for like a week. Mm -hmm. time, to, time to go back home for like a week, um, pack some stuff up for summer league and, um, you know, come back out here. That's all right. Now, according from your Instagram, which I saw, uh, your locker mate is somebody special. Yes, Mr. Curry. Mr. Curry, B. Steph Curry. What did it? What is it like when you walk into the locker room? You're like, oh wow, my locker mate is Steph Curry. What do you What are you expecting from Steph throughout the season, mm -hmm. as he mentors you as a your rookie season, and what do you hope to look forward to with Steph? Yeah, I think the uh, first time I was in there, I, mean, I kind of was in awe just just to see his name up there, see Chris's name up there, Clay, yeah. Draymond, guys that have been through it, and you know are great players at NBA. Um, but yeah, I think Steph and SCP have done a great job mentoring me mm -hmm. already just this far. And, um, have taught me a lot about my guard position, but also um, how winners can win. Um, you know, Steph is here. I expect him to, you know, be in the MVP talks again. Uh, I think we have a real shot at uh, winning a championship this year, just based on the roster that, you know, Mike Dudley and, and uh, his organization to put together. And I think uh, for me personally, I think um, you know, I can do something similar to what Dante did the did last year. Sure. Um, you know, just put my best foot forward and um, doing whatever the team kind of needs. Yeah, and I think you that you do that best. I've never seen anybody do it quite like you do, and I think Dante and even Chumzo was a perfect comparison. We were playing last night, right? Rebounding, assisting, scoring, pretty much do it all. So I think if you go in there, and obviously with somebody who's as mature as you that gets it, that understands and knows that it's ultimately it's kind of like Steph. Curry's team, yeah. but obviously Klay Thompson and Draymond make it go. Then you have everybody else who does their, their part, knowing that you're somebody who is able to fit on any team because you just want to do whatever you can to help the team win. I think that'll fit in perfectly, so I'm definitely looking forward to, to seeing that. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Now, talk about how much your team keeps track of you. When I say team, I don't mean basketball team. All of us have a team behind us that allow us to do what it is that we do. So your family, your agent, whoever your best friends are. Can you talk about who your team consists of and how they kind of manage you and make sure that you're developing and that you're keeping your head on straight? Yes, yeah, so obviously my parents, uh, my mom, my stepdad, my dad, okay. my grandparents, um, uh, my uncle, I consider him, Antonio Curl. I've uh, been with him since 80 days. It kind of has got me to where I am. Um, obviously I put it to work, but mm -hmm. his relationships and stuff kind of led me to uh, what it is. Uh, my agent, Bill Delphi, Mm -hmm. um, and then my financial advisor, I think that team, along with my, my three best friends, uh, you know, Gerald Nolan and Bain, um, I think they kind of just keep me going and, um, the smaller the circle, the better, the yeah. less to keep track of, um, mm -hmm. less to take care of. Um, but I think all in all, I have a good circle behind me and they want, you know, just what's best for me and they don't want anything in return. For sure. And now for somebody that's as wise as you, as I listen to you talk and just understand life, you just understand, you get it. Uh, what's the advice you would give to your younger self or to younger basketball players that are out there as they're aspiring to be come an NBA player? Yeah, I think it's a process, um, you know, and it doesn't matter when you start, it doesn't matter if you start at four years old, three years old, when you come out the womb, eighth grade like me. Um, it's just about all understanding. And I think a big thing that I picked up when I was in high school that I did a lot of was watching a lot of European basketball. Mm. 
And I think um, just by watching them play, guys like Bonnu, Luka, Jokic, guys like that, just watching them play, um, it really developed my IQ for the game. Because um, I grew up around people that like to play one-on-one ice of ball. And that's kind of how I grew up, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade. And then, you know, the 10th, 11th, 12th grade year, I watched a lot of European ball. And I understood, like, okay, the game will just kind of like how chess is played. And, um, you know, different pieces in different ways. And that's how it works. And I think by watching that, um, it really helped me. Yeah, that's interesting because I've never read it for who Did somebody say, hey, we should watch European basketball? Was that just strictly on your own? I remember... Uh, Forget what you, I think it was my maybe tenth grade year during the off season. I, I worked with uh, a guy named Ty Sabet, mm. uh, all time leading scorer at a D three school up north in Wisconsin called Ribbon College. And uh, I remember he was overseas and he's still overseas now. And uh, you know, was the leading scorer in all the leagues. And um, I'd watch his highlights and I just watched how the team played and it was like super unselfish, super different to the traditional NBA look. And, uh, and I was like, well, what if I just do it like him, but I add my own spin to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of just took it from there and just tried to understand the game before my skills kind of caught up. And I think, you know, your IQ and your, your mental toughness can take you way farther than just having a bunch of skate. 100%, 100%. Now, as you get ready to transfer into the professional leagues, is there something that you look forward to the most as the season approaches? What do you look forward to the most? Yeah, I think uh, playing back home in Milwaukee will be fun. Um, I got a bad taste in my mouth from last time I played there. I only played there when I was at Illinois and I didn't play it. Um, <laughs> what team were you playing? Marquette? Yeah, yeah. played Marquette. Um, did it play? It's kind of embarrassing actually. It's a lot of people there. Um, it happens. But I didn't play. Um, so I'm looking forward to going back there. I and mean, then I always wanted to play the MSG. Mm. So just playing them, you know, being able to play against an Indra and Dopich, I think is what I'm most looking forward to with a shirt. Yeah. And are there any players you're looking forward to guarding the most? I know all of us have our favorite best players. Is there somebody you look forward to guarding just because of the challenge that they Yeah, I think uh, for me, I think my biggest challenge would be, you know, Devin Booker, Donovan Mitchell, um, Darius Garland, uh, just quick shifty guards that, mm -hmm. you know, you get to their spots and are affected at all three levels. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to talking with you in the future about what your welcome to the NBA moment is because I know we all get a welcome to like professional basketball moment where like, you know, we come in and we're so used to playing at the level below us and now we come in and we're like, okay, now we're playing with like dudes who like are the best at what they do, the top 1% and then something crazy happens, you get crossed over, whatever it is, whatever it is, it, it always happens, it's nothing bad, but I'm looking forward uh, to hearing what that story is about. Now, I want to take it back to college real quick. What is your favorite memory while you were at Santa Clara uh, University? Uh, favorite memory, I would say. Or favorite game, and why? Honestly, I would say either sweeping San Francisco or sweeping BYU, um, and then celebrating coaches. Forget how many wins, but it was like a career milestone for him. I remember we beat DePaul mm -hmm. uh, in the Bahamas uh, to do that. So he did one of those three. Uh, you know, we haven't beat BYU both times or at Provo. Um, this is since Nash was there. Mm -hmm. um, and then just being San Francisco will beat us both times the year before. Um, probably one of those three. Yeah. Uh, did, some, did anything ever stick out when it came to playing for Coach Rip Syntec? Like the way he coached you personally, is there anything that stuck stuck out? Yeah, you could tell he understands, understands basketball. And, um, but he also has a good feel of like, to let his players just be free and be flowing, but also at the same time, like, teach them, like, what needs to be taught. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think during the games, you know, he doesn't really say much. I think the assistants really say more than him. Um, but yeah, he kind of just lets us figure it out. I think he knew that he had two high key players of me and Keyshawn um, that could kind of control the game, you know, per se, and, you know, help our teammates bring them off. Um, so he kind of just let us rock more so much. Sure. He's like a coach that get you prepared and then once it's time to go shine let you do your thing and that's why i love it yeah. now you had the opportunity to play summer league already your first summer league i think i remember either texting you this or sharing it with you on instagram you were going through your shooting struggles but i was just trying to tell you hey keep shooting the basketball because as shooters we're going to always struggle and obviously this is you first starting off shooting from the nba three-point line can you just talk about how you keep that confidence to keep shooting and, and 
ultimately, like, when it comes to kids younger than us, how you can explain to them, like, okay, shooting struggles are going to happen. Nobody's going to shoot perfectly all the time. You've seen Curry go in his slumps. But no matter what, he tells himself, hey, I got to keep shooting to get myself out of that. Is that something you'll tell yourself if, if you ever go through that again? Or how will you break out? Yeah, I think uh, just kind of growing up, uh, even go, I was going to summer league, I think, um, you know, coming off shooting 44% from three at Santa Clara, you know, you know it's there. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's over 30-some games of shooting five, six threes a game. So you know it's there. Um, but I think um, the summer league per se, um, just seeing – uh, different looks, different athleticism, different size, I think, uh, was a challenge for me. And I think since summer league, I've got way better at that. I don't know. But then just watching, like, CP and Steph and them guys work out at summer league, like, they missed too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think that was kind of a relieving moment for me. Like, okay, like, I can miss some shots too. Yeah. Because, um, you know, sometimes you try to be so perfect and not miss at all. Um, just seeing them guys miss it kind of – and I hate to say it, but like it gave me some of these, like, okay, I can miss two. Yeah. Um, so I think the confidence piece, I think it just comes from your work ethic. Um, if you know you put the time in and the work ethic, it's just like school. If you put the time in, do it, like, there's really nothing to stress about because at the end of the day, you can't control if it goes in or not. Exactly. Um, that's why I like to, you know, control other aspects of the game that I know I can physically control. For sure. And I'm curious on your thoughts because of what you just said. You said that you actually had a chance to see Steph Curry and Chris Paul work out in person. So you were able to see that they do this. I think so much in our time today, we see so many videos that are clipped and edited that we're only seeing people make shots and do everything perfectly. And that's kind of like what social media portrays is like everything's perfect, everybody's perfect. Uh, do you try to stay away from that and focus, try not to focus as much on social media because you know that what you're seeing may not truly be real. There's ebbs and flows, there's people that struggle behind the scenes in order to get to the point at where they are. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm old enough now where I'm a realist and I know kind of what's real and what's not. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, being a professional basketball player, you know what's real and what's fake. Yeah. The majority of the time when it comes to basketball things. And so, you know, I'm on social media, I look at stuff like that, but at the same time, on a day to day basis, I watch it happen with my own eyes. So I know what's real and Steph's the best shirt. Sure. Planet Earth. Mm-hmm. So like, I know if he misses everybody else for sure. It's for sure. <laughs> Now, you are already uh, integrating yourself with the Golden State Warriors this summer. Uh, what does your daily regimen look like when it comes to training, when it comes to, to eating, strength training, all of that? What does that look like? Yeah, I think uh, we go back to 6.30, um, go to the facility, eat breakfast at 7.30, um, treatment at 8, um, then we start our performance and, and we'll make core exercises, lift at 8.45 um, till about 10.15, 10.30. Um, right now, it's... Uh, most of the rookies, um, mm-hmm. the veterans are sprinkle in here and there, um, and then a bunch of free agent guys. Um, and then we play from about 10.45 to 12.30 and 1 o'clock, and then I'll get my lift in um, after from about 1 to 2.30, and then, you know, get some lunch cover. So, I mean, I, I really treat it like a 9 to 5. Yeah. Regular job. Um, just there from 7.30 to usually 3.30 every day. Love it. And then just go home, kind of do whatever. I love it. Love it. And obviously, Steve Kerr, who's with Team USA right now, so you probably don't get to see him around that much. I know you met him uh, right after getting drafted, but what are you most looking forward to when it comes to being coached by Steve Kerr, who's an uh, all-time champion as a player and as a coach? Yeah, I think uh, I think through our conversation so far, uh, we actually talked before they left for USA basketball. Um, kind of just talked about what I bring and um, how he thinks I could fit with any lineup. I can play the one through one through four, um, and uh, that helps me in a sense where, you know, there's a lot of minutes to be taken, especially with you being so versatile. And um, he knows, like, the, sh- the shooter show, because some of the that happens, he said Steph shot 22% some lead. So yeah. um, that also gave him more confidence, like, okay, if he did it, I can do it too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I think Coach Kerr, he's one of those players, kind of like Coach Senek, where he doesn't really say much. You can um, It's more behind-the-scenes stuff. And, he just lets his player rock, especially when you have, you know, play it, Steph, and Draymond, but kind of just feed it as it is. Sure. And, Bill, we're all looking forward uh, to seeing you play for the Golden State Warriors. I know it's it's my favorite team. It's been my favorite team, and Steph is my favorite player. So to see you alongside of him and see how you guys operate and work together, I know it's going to be something that's interesting to see. Uh, is there any last advice that you can give to all the, the young Hoopers who are – 
finding their way or maybe struggling in terms of how they can manage themselves, manage their lives as they continue to try to get to wherever it is they want to when it comes to basketball? Yeah, I think um, go where you're needed. Doesn't matter where you go. Doesn't matter where you come from or high school you go to. Um, I think when you're when you're looking at shoes a school, I think none of it should base, be based on NIL because the pro contracts are way better. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll take my money over some NIL money. Yeah. Um, um, but I think just a combination of those and then, you know, just, you just get out of it what you put into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it comes down to like the confidence piece, you know what you put in. Um, sometimes it's not going to go your way, but at the end of the day, over a course of a year, it seems the percentages are balance out. But that seems what you just said, the NIO money. I know that's changing everything. So you telling young folks, don't worry about that. That's not what's important. Focus on the task at hand, regardless of what you're being paid. And if you succeed in that, then you ultimately get to the true prize, which is the NBA. And the money up here is way better. Yeah, for sure. And it's an NIO money. For sure. So <laughs> I just, you know, take it, take it slow at the beginning, and then at the end, you reap the benefits. I love it. I love it. Well, I hate that we never got to play together. Uh, I said the same thing in JM, but I'm glad uh, people don't know. But last night we got the chance to play together, all three of us on the same team. So I think that was pretty cool just to see what it could have been like. And, and I am just couldn't be more excited to see you and to see Jalen at the NBA stage, seeing what you guys can do. And just know that we're all rooting for you. All of Santa Clara is rooting for you. And I know all of back home in the Midwest is rooting for you as well, too. Yeah. We appreciate you for coming on the Link with JB podcast. Oh, man. Thanks for having me. And we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you again. Yes, sir. Love that. Go shit.